<laughs> so that movie, 300, was based on what is called the Battle of Thermopylae, which was fought between an alliance of Greek city-states that was led by King Leonidas of Sparta and the Persian Empire, which was led by Xerxes, who probably wasn't quite the same character as he is in the, uh, the movie. Um, but that battle, which happened over the course of three days, happened during the second invasion of Persia into Greece, and it took place in the summer of 480 B.C. at the narrow, narrow coastal pass of Thermopylae, which, if you've watched the movie, was often called the Hot Gates or the Gates of Hell. It's kind of how they say it in the movie. The Persian invasion was actually a delayed response to the defeat of the first Persian invasion of Greece, uh, which had ended actually in a, a victory uh, by the Athenians at the Battle of Marathon in 490 B.C. And so Xerxes, in response, amasses this huge army and navy of hundreds of thousands of people, and he sets out to conquer all of Greece. And obviously the Athenian allies, they block the advance of the Persian army at this small little pass um, called the, the Hot Gates. And so this small force of vastly outnumbered Spartans, these warriors held off the Persians for seven days, including three days of intense battle. They finally were defeated because one of their own kind of betrayed them and told of a path around the backside of the army. But for two full days of battle, this small force led by uh, Leonidas blocked the only road by which the Persians could pass. And again, after the second day of battle, this kind of local residence betrayed the Greeks and revealed this small path behind Greek lines. And Leonidas, aware that his force was about to be defeated, <clears throat> dismissed the bulk of the Greek army, and he remained to stand guard along with his 300 Spartans and a few hundred others, and most of them ended up dying. They were killed. And even though the Persians were able to penetrate Greece after that battle, eventually the Persians had lost so many men and so many warriors, and they lost so much momentum that they eventually retreated back into Asia, and eventually the Persian invasion ended. And I love kind of those historical stories throughout world history. Uh, both ancient and modern writers have used that battle, the Battle of Thermopylae, as an example of the power of a patriotic, patriotic army uh, defending its native soil. And the performance of those Spartans during that battle is also used in the example of the advantages and the training and the equipment and the good use of terrain as a force um, and has become a symbol of courage against overwhelming odds. Now, here's the interesting thing about Sparta. Sparta was the only ancient Greek city-state with no walls. No walls. Walls were a big deal in ancient warfare to keep your people in and to keep enemies out. Sparta had no walls and became a world force without walls. History tells us that one man asked a Spartan king who was bragging about his walls, where are your walls? And the Spartan king pointed to his warriors and said, these are the walls of Sparta. In our text today, we ask Peter, this disciple that is writing this letter to these scattered followers of Jesus, we ask Peter, where is the church? Where is the church? And Peter points not to a building, but he points to us. And he points to the followers of Jesus, and he says, you are the walls. You are the bricks. You are the the church. We're in a series called Exiles that's based out of the small letter of First Peter. If you're new with us, we're in this series and we've been making our way through the book of First Peter. Um, we're a Bible teaching church here at City Church, so let me encourage you to grab your Bible and turn to First Peter. We're going to camp out in our text today or grab your smartphone and do your Jesus app or whatever to get the text up. 
Um, but we're going to be in 1 Peter today, and the passage where we are in this series is actually a, a turning point in Peter's letter. It's a turning point to these scattered, persecuted believers who are throughout Asia Minor at this time, and Peter's been talking to them about how do we live for Jesus in a culture that is anti-Jesus. Sounds very relevant to us today, right? How do we follow Christ in a culture that's not a Christian culture? and at times can be hostile toward Christian followers. And Peter began his letter, and if you haven't followed the series, I would encourage you to go back and on our website or our social media and listen to these messages because they all build off of each other and um, kind of get where we're at and stay along. If you have to, be, have to be gone, you know, make sure you get the podcast or whatever and listen to the messages. And then I always, also want to always encourage you to read the text, like spend time in First Peter before you get here on Sunday. I'll kind of give you a heads up. Uh, what we'll be talking about. But if you've been here, you know that for several weeks, Peter basically has been assuring us of who we are, of telling us who we are in Jesus, and that our, our hope and confidence in our future is based on Christ and not on us. And then in the 14th verse of chapter 1, Peter started this therefore section, based on who you are, therefore conduct yourselves in a certain way. And he speaks of our current conduct in everyday life based on our future hope in Jesus, that a life that is grounded in the gospel is marked by obedience and holiness and godly fear and love for each other. And again, those words may not mean exactly what we thought they meant. Um, if we kind of grew up in church, we've discovered that they actually mean who we are in Christ is grounded in who Jesus is, and that reflects who we are in everyday life. Now, next week, we'll begin in verse 11 of chapter 2. And from that point through the rest of the book of 1 Peter, Peter basically focuses specifically on our lives within culture. What does it look like to follow Jesus in a hostile environment? What does it look like to follow Jesus in everyday life? Do not miss next week, because here's what we're going to talk about. What does it look like to follow Jesus in a political environment, a political season? And next week, I'm going to tell you who I'm voting for. I'm just kidding. I'm not... <laughs> But next week, we are going to talk about what does it look like to have a viewpoint of politics uh, in our culture, and we're going to take it right out of the text, because it's important to learn what Peter has to say on how do we respond with government, how do we respond in politics. So Peter's going to take it very street level starting next week. We're going to talk about how do we follow Jesus in a politically charged climate, how do we follow Jesus at work? How do we follow Jesus in our home lives? How do we follow Jesus when friends have betrayed us? So we're going to really take it street level next week. But in between these sections, we come to our text today, chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. And what we'll learn, as always, is that our conduct is based on our calling. We've said it time and time again, that our who always precedes our what. That who we are in Jesus precedes how we live that out, what we do in everyday life, how we live for Christ in everyday life. And this is no exception. Before he launches into the street-level faith, he tells us who we are in Christ. And his focus is a little different in this section than it has been in previous weeks in that he really drills down on what it means to live as a community of Jesus' followers in everyday life, our community identity as Jesus' followers. It's kind of that corporate image that we need each other. We say here at City Church that we live intentionally in community, that we need each other, that we were not meant to do the Christian walk alone, that God doesn't raise up Lone Ranger Christians. And even Lone Ranger had his tonto, right? Like we do life together. And that's why it's important to plug into a city group. And I know, I know like, when Ashley stands up here and says, hey, we're going to watch like 15 minutes of video, and then we're going to have amazing discussion. Some of you are like me, like, I don't want to discuss. Like, oh, am I going to get called on? Like, am I going to be asked a theological question? Don't worry. Put your minds at ease. Again, you can be comfortable in these environments. We're going to do life together. Uh, there will be some discussion, but if you're kind of the person that doesn't want to contribute, it's fine for you to come and hear and just you know, be around some other people. Um, and again, child care option, no child care option. You work out what works for you. Uh, I think Ash didn't say that the child care option is going to be meeting at the Priceville Boys and Girls Club. And so the kids are not going to be like in the room with you, but we will have somebody there to watch them. <laughs> and then the non-kid option is meeting at the Parkway Medical Center. 
for some reason, they wouldn't give us like four rooms for the kids to hang out in at the hospital. But <laughs> so choose wisely on your small group selection. Uh, but doing life together, we need each other, particularly with Peter's emphasis that we are, are aliens and sojourners in this foreign land. Now, think about it from this perspective. If I was an American, and we live in, a, uh, again, a very politically charged climate in today's day and age. If I, as an American, were somewhere international, if I was somewhere overseas, and I felt like I was in a very uncomfortable situation, and I felt very alone and surrounded by people that were non-Americans, and suddenly I saw an American, another American, that it was obvious that that person was an American and I was an American. Imagine that feeling in that moment, like you have found, you probably don't know their name, their hometown or anything, you just know they're from your homeland. Imagine the natural connection that you would feel in that moment. Being in an environment that you're uncomfortable, you're unsure, the people around you were different from a different culture, you're not sure if they're for you, against you, and suddenly you see someone that is from your homeland, that would be an awesome feeling, right? That's kind of what Peter does for us in this text, that we are fellow sojourners, aliens, we've said, exiles passing through this world. Look at verse 4 as we jump into our text. Chapter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Now, let's drill down what Peter's doing here. Before he kind of launches into who we are together, he lays our foundation. Peter lays the foundation of the church. And the foundation is the most important piece of the building. And the foundation that Peter describes here, look at the contrast. A living stone that's been rejected by men. Okay, so this stone has been rejected on one hand. But on the other hand, in the sight of God, this stone is chosen and precious. So see how Peter puts these two worlds at contrast. He's writing to believers who are being persecuted, who are suffering for their faith. They're very uncomfortable and unsure about their future in the culture. And Peter says, you are standing on a foundation of a stone that is rejected, rejected, but chosen and precious in God's sight. A living stone rejected by man in the sight of God, chosen and and precious. Our number one core value at City Church is that the church belongs to who? To Jesus. Not to us, not to the leaders of the church, not to whatever board you've heard of in church government life, not to even the people of the church. That the church first and foremost and ultimately belongs to Jesus. And we see that here in our text. Now, a rock is a very common metaphor for God in the, throughout the Bible. In Genesis chapter 49, the very first book of the Bible, God is pictured as a foundational stone. If you remember the story of the Exodus, when Moses was leading the children of Israel through the desert, there was a time when they were completely out of water and thirsty, and God said to Moses, I want you to speak to a rock, and water is going to flow from that rock. And Moses, in kind of an act of rebellion, actually took his staff and hit the rock, and water came out of the rock. And so the rock, again, was, was some deep symbolism. As a matter of fact, Paul picks up in 1 Corinthians that same passage and says that that rock actually represented Jesus, that Jesus is the rock from which life flows. So from the opening pages of the Bible, we again and again and again see this image of God as a rock. Um, In the book of Deuteronomy, in Psalms, in Isaiah, there are frequent references to God as our rock. And that idea of rock is an idea of security, of steadfastness, a trustworthy foundation. Let me show you this text. I love what Peter does here because if we look back in John chapter 1, this is the story when Peter that wrote the book that we've been spending time in was called to follow Jesus. In John chapter 1 verse 40, one of the two, this is the disciples, one of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Okay, so the guy that wrote our book, 1 Peter, 
His brother, Andrew, was a follower of John the Baptist. He hears John point people to Jesus. Andrew becomes a follower of Jesus. He leaves John and begins to follow Jesus, and he immediately thinks of his brother, Peter. And so look what he does in 41. He first found his own brother, Simon. Again, this is a, by the way, this is a great model for reaching other people in your life. When Andrew was changed by Jesus, he went out and found the people that were the closest to him and brought them to Jesus. That's kind of a cool model for us to follow, right? And so he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, so you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means, and in our ESV translation, it says Peter. The word can also be translated stone or rock. Simon, or Andrew brings his brother, Simon Peter, to Jesus. Jesus looks at him and says, hey, what's your name? He's like, well, my name is Simon. He's like, well, you're not going to be Simon anymore. Do what? You're not going to be Simon anymore. From now on, you're going to be the rock. Now, that's kind of cool. Like, you know, Dwayne Johnson, kind of the rock, you know. Um, you know, put me in the WWE or whatever at that moment. But you're going to be the rock. I thought thought about this moment, like, how did Peter feel in that moment? Like, he walks up to this guy that's supposed to be the Messiah, and he changes his name on the fly. Like, can you imagine if that happened today? Uh, Changing names is not an uncommon thing in the Bible, is it? Abe went to Abraham. Jacob went to Israel. There's always some deep spiritual significance when God changes your name. And we know, based on the life of Peter, that he was anything but stable. He was like the opposite of stable in every way. But God saw, Jesus saw in Simon who he would become in Jesus. And so he renames him Peter, the rock. And so it's interesting when we hear Peter now saying, we stand on a firm foundation, the rock, Jesus Christ. Peter was also present in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, which is a verse that we use a lot around here because it talks about the church belongs to Jesus. But in that passage, when Jesus is challenging his disciples, like, who do people say that I am? Remember what Jesus, they said that you are Jesus, the Son of God. Remember what, how Jesus responded? He said, upon this rock, right, upon this, I will build my church. The church belongs to Jesus. So another instance when this same concept, the same metaphor is used of a rock or a stone or a foundation. Now I brought a little rock from my house in case anyone falls asleep while I'm teaching. Um, So you tell me, what are some adjectives that you would use to describe a rock? Just call them out. What are some words, adjectives that you would use to describe a rock? Hard, what? Solid. What else? Heavy. What else? That's it. That's our three adjectives. Solid, rock, heavy. All those are good adjectives to describe a rock. Now, why did no one scream out living? That's kind of an unusual word to define a rock. Living stone. Living rock. Now, we've all heard of a rolling stone, but that's different than a living stone, right? Zach was walking in front of me this morning. I was like, Zach, rolling stones. I know, it's really cheesy. But we would not use the word living normally to describe a rock. And Peter says, the foundation of the church is a living rock. Now, there's two ideas behind that concept of living. The first idea is that it's not a monument, that Jesus is not an idol. Now, we could put up pictures of famous religious leaders who have been turned into idols. We could put up Chubby Buddha. Everybody would recognize him, right? That's the leader of a certain world religion is a fat guy turned into stone. Like, that's who they follow. But Jesus is not a monument. He's not an idol. He sees, he hears, he answers, he engages his creation. And the second idea, and probably the more important one in this text, is the living stone means that this stone has been raised to life. 
You've heard me say frequently that the resurrection is what separates Christianity from every other world religion, from every other faith system out there. Because we believe Jesus is alive. He's not a monument. He's not someone that's dead and stayed dead, and then we just think he had really cool teachings that should be heard throughout the rest of the world. Our faith, Paul says, stands on the resurrection, and if you remove the resurrection from our faith, everything crumbles. Close our Bibles and go home. Let's just go get ready for the Super Bowl if the resurrection is not true. We're wasting our time being here. But Peter says that our stone is a living stone. He hears, he sees, he engages his creation. And more importantly, he's been raised back to life. The church will not die because it stands on a sure, living foundation that is validated in the resurrection of Jesus himself. Now, I want to point out one thing about this this verse. It's the very first phrase of verse 4. Peter says, as you come to him. Now, there's not a lot of times I like want you to understand the Greek because sometimes I always feel like it sounds a little like, oh, Devin knows Greek. But this is a Greek tense that's very important. It's a continual idea. As we are continually coming to him. I love that tense. As we are continually, as you continually come to him. You know what that says to me? We constantly need him. We constantly rest in who he is. We constantly stand on Jesus as our foundation. You know what it also says? Not only do we continually come to him, but he is constantly available. What a promise is that? That when we come to him, he is available. He's not too busy. He's not distracted. He's not removed. He's not aloof from his creation that we can come to him. And when we come, he is available. The church stands on a sure foundation because it belongs to Jesus and we rest on him. And look what Peter says as we rest on him in verse 5. As we're resting on him, you yourselves like living stones, there it is again, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. As we're coming to him, as we rest on him, Peter says we are like living stones. We reflect Jesus. We are being built up as living stones, as a spiritual house. House, what does that mean? That means that his life gives us life. That we are alive spiritually because he is alive. That he's been raised back to life and his life permeates our lives. That our spiritual lives are generated by his spiritual life. That we stand in a stream of people who have passed over from death to to life, that we in 2016 stand in a stream of salvation history of hundreds of thousands of millions of people who have been been spiritually born again and have passed over from death into life, that Jesus continually and always, generation after generation after generation, is building his church. And that's why Peter says, he is the cornerstone. We just sang it. He is the cornerstone. He's the foundational stone upon which we stand. That we are the walls, that we are the bricks, that we are the mortar. But he is the foundation upon which the building stands. Now, let's be really honest. The walls can get really shaky, can't they? The walls, the bricks, we can be really insecure. We can be very fickle. Like that's why it's so important that the church belongs to Jesus. It's not our church, it's his church. Because the walls stand upon the foundation of Jesus. You've heard me say, I'm glad that salvation is not up to me. That it's a God thing. That if salvation was strictly a Devon thing, then I can tell you, I'm going to fail. Salvation is of him. He is the sure 
foundation upon which we stand. And that's why, that's why he is our chief cornerstone because he's the most important. In ancient architecture, back in biblical times, they would build buildings based on the foundation of a giant stone. They would bring that stone in, they would chisel it, they would place it strategically so that the entire building was standing upon the foundation of a single stone. And that's the idea that Peter gives us here. And again, this is a common New Testament theme, that we are the living building of God. Think about this in comparison to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the symbolism of where God resides was what? It was a tabernacle in the desert, and then they built this magnificent temple that still was around when Jesus was walking the earth. And Peter makes this transition that in Old Covenant, God's presence was symbolized in a temple or tabernacle. But now we are the building of God. That the temple was destroyed, that the veil was ripped when Jesus died on the cross, that God no longer resides in the Holy of Holies inside of a temple. That God now resides where? In our hearts and lives. That we are the temple of God. That we are the building of God. That the Holy of Holies is now in us. God resides in His followers. That God the Spirit lives inside of us. That's why the church can't be confined to a location. Because we are the church. And it doesn't matter if we're in a theater at a Carmike Cinema or if we're in a thousand-seat auditorium or if we're under a tree in the middle of a third-world country. We are the church. That the church is not confined to a building because we are the walls. We are the church. You can't confine the church to a location. Look what Peter says here are the two purposes of the church. Back in verse 5 again. You like living stones are being built up in the spiritual house to do what? To be one, a holy priesthood. A lot of Old Testament imagery there. The idea of holiness and a priesthood. The concept is that we've been set apart for God. That we represent God within our world. That we stand, we stand between God and non-followers. A holy priesthood that that we stand as a go-between to represent God to those around us who do not know him. A holy priesthood. And then the second purpose, he says, to, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We learn in other texts like Hebrews, and that means that we are offering ourselves to God, that our life is a constant act of worship before God, that we are called to live a life of worship, that worship is not just a genre of music, or worship is not just what we do on Sunday morning when we are singing, but all of life is worship. That all of life is, is his followers constantly giving themselves and giving what they have and giving who they are to the God that we serve. And that we have been made acceptable to God through Jesus. That our lives, don't miss this, our lives are acceptable to God because of Jesus, not because of our own efforts or our own works. And do we really grasp that? And we struggle in life, don't we? Like, God can't be pleased with this, or I don't feel acceptable to God, or, hey, I read my Bible this week, so I feel a little better this week about my spiritual life. And, man, we based our acceptance so much on what we do or do not do. What God says to us is, God says, Devin, you are acceptable to me, not because of what you do and what you do not do. You're acceptable to me because of what Jesus has done. And your response to that is you should live a life that is marked by worship that is marked by surrendering yourself constantly as you come to Him, constantly coming and resting in who Jesus is, preaching the gospel to ourselves day in and day out, being reminded of who we are in Him. Starting in verse 6, Peter goes Old Testament on us to explain this. Verse 6, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion, Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever builds, believes in Him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. And we say, do what? Here's what Peter's saying. 
He goes to the Old Testament and he draws from three passages. Isaiah chapter 8, Isaiah chapter 28, and Psalm 118. And what Peter is telling us, drawing from these Old Testament passages, what Peter is saying is that it has been God's intention from the beginning. From all of history, it has been God's intention to call out and to preserve a movement of followers, which naturally means that there will be believers and there will be none believers. And he describes it here. He says, look, the same stone, the same stone who offers life to those who believe is also a source of scandal. The word here is stumbling. The word stumbling is the same word where we get the word scandal. Is also the, the same source that gives life is also a source of scandal, a stumbling block to those who do not believe. So again, we stand in a stream of salvation history that God has been writing a story of redemption from the very beginning. And in God's story, in God's story, all people are sinners who by nature reject God's redemptive plan, God's plan to pursue them. And by nature, as sinners, we reject God's plan and we pursue our own idolatrous heart. We put us on the throne. We put me on the throne. We displace God with my desires, my wants, my sins, my desires. And so throughout all of human history, there's been this mark that we are sinners who reject naturally the redemptive plan of God to pursue our own hearts. And yet, and yet, in the midst of that, God provides an escape. God provides a means. God provides an instrument by which people who are defined by faith, right? They believe on the Son of God, and as a result of their belief, they receive life. And those who do not, what did he say? They are put to shame. What's Peter saying here? Throughout human history, our lives have been marked by sin. But God has been weaving a story of redemption that for those who believe in his name, they are children of God. And those who do not believe, they are put to shame. They face the consequences of disbelief in God's story. And so throughout all of church history, the people of God have been defined by this same mantra that by Grace alone, through faith alone, we are His people. That we don't deserve it, that we don't earn it, that we can't please God with our own sinful nature, but God has been writing this story of redemption that we become a part of by grace alone, through faith alone. That is our mantra, and we stand again in this history, this stream of followers of Jesus who for generation after generation, century after century, we like to say that we are an ancient future people. That so Sometimes the church can get so focused on who we are in the here and now that we forget about the stream from which we came that we join hands with generations and generations and generations of followers who have said time and time again in the face of opposition, in the face of disbelief, in the face of cultures that were hostile against them, they have said time and time again, our faith, our trust is in Jesus alone. We rest in His grace alone. And that is a foundation that cannot be moved because it is written in the annals of God's history. That history is his story. The church belongs to Jesus. He is building his church. Let me scare you a little bit. It's going to scare us because of the titles Peter gives us now. Check this out. See if you feel like these things describe you. Starting in verse 9. But you, so he's contrasting us to those who stumble in disbelief. But you, followers, Our chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, 
that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Look at Peter's royal identity phrases of Jesus' followers. And notice they're all communal. They're all about a group of people, right? He calls us a chosen race, a chosen race, that God has set his affection on us as his people. And doesn't it feel great to be chosen? Like whatever you're doing in life, like you don't want to be the kid that's like the last one to be picked for the kickball team or like, well, I'll take him because he's the only one left. Like that doesn't do a lot for your self-esteem, right, when you're a kid. Um, Man, it feels great whatever you're doing in life to know that you're accepted, that you're chosen. Um, All of us would have liked to have been the name that, that got the digits for the grand lotto recently, right? Like how cool it would have been to be chosen for that prize. We have this idea of chosen in our world, and our identity is so tied with it. And here Peter says, you're a chosen race, the God, the God of the heavens that is building his church has chosen you, has set his affections on you as his followers. A chosen race. This is the second title. A chosen race, a royal priesthood. I don't know about you, but there's not many times I'm walking around in life feeling like, hey, I'm a royal priest. Back it up. Royal priest in the house. That's not what Peter means here, is it? What, what Peter means is we have access to the king of kings. That there's not a go-between for the follower of Jesus and Jesus himself. I don't have to show up at a church where there's a priest to evoke God for me. I don't have to go to a booth and talk to someone behind a curtain to intercede on my behalf. That as a follower of Jesus, I have direct access to the King of Kings. I don't have to bypass. I don't have to wait my turn. I don't have to take a number at the DMV. I don't have to wait. I have direct, immediate access to the God of the universe. You're a royal priesthood. You're of royal descent. You are a holy nation. You have been set apart, he says, as God's people, that we are a nation within the nations, that the followers of Jesus are a people. They're a nation within the nations. Whatever label you wear, American, Canadian, Mexican, European, whatever label you wear from wherever you're from, as a follower of Jesus, you're a nation within the nations. A chosen people. It's been called by God. I love this next one. You are His possession. You're His possession. If you're a parent, like you relate to that, right? Like you see that child and you think they're mine. Like that's my kid. There's nothing they can do to change that. They're my kid. Ups, downs, good, bad, ugly. That's my kid. Peter says we are His possession. We belong to him. That Jesus laid claim to you on the cross. That you are his. Let me make an important point here. Because I know in my life, I don't always feel like these things. I don't always feel like these titles. The struggle is real, right? I don't think a lot of us are walking around with our heads held high saying, I'm a royal priest, back it up. The struggle is real because of sin and because of the temporary nature of who we are. Do you know these titles are not about our worth as much as they are about His worth? That these titles are more about Him than they are about us, that we find our value not in us but in who Jesus is. That even when I do not feel very holy, or royal, or like God is near me, or that I'm his prized possession, when I don't feel very chosen, that my value in Jesus doesn't change. Because it's about his worth, and not my worth. That he is the one who has claimed us for his own, through the good, the bad, the ugly, the sins, the doubts, the two steps forward, three steps back, that there is nothing that changes who we are in Jesus. As his followers. Ash was involved in a conversation this week with 
lady that was struggling with a lot of life, and she was making a life decision that was not a decision that was a healthy one. And, and her response was, well, I guess God will just be angry at me for a little while. And I thought, that's not the image of the God that we serve. And even in the midst of our horrible decision-making and sinful choices that our God has set His affection on you. That doesn't give us, as we've talked about, doesn't give us an excuse to go out and live life as we choose and, well, hey, let's go sin and have a party because God's grace is big. It is big, and it's bigger than whatever sin you commit. But when we realize His affection has been set on us, it draws our heart to Him, not away from Him. we got to move. I love this next little section. He defines what you once were versus what you are in Jesus. He says what? You were called out of darkness into His marvelous light. Like you could not see. You were blind and you've been called out of that darkness, that blindness into His marvelous light. This next phrase he draws from the Old Testament prophet of Hosea that you were not a people but now you are a people. That's an identity issue, right? That my identity is in Jesus. And we live in this culture that has such a distorted idea of where our identity is found. And we look for it in all the wrong places and how much money we have, what we look like, what my friends at school say, what's happening at work. Our, our identity is so crazy and we try to find it in all these places. And Peter says, There is a God who has set his affection on you, and your identity is found in him. You were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And I love this next phrase. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Last week we said it. We have tasted mercy. His kindness. We have tasted His goodness. We were not a people and now we are the people. We had not received mercy and now we have received mercy. We were in the darkness and now we are in the marvelous light of God through Jesus. I'll tell you, when we wrap our minds around this, we'll learn what it means to worship. When we wrap our minds around this, we'll learn what it means to tell other people about Jesus that we can't help but tell them because we were not a people and now we are a people. I had not received mercy, but now I have received mercy. When we have tasted His goodness and we grasp the gospel, when we get how sinful we are and how righteous and holy and grace-filled He is, it changes everything about life. Do you see the purpose? In that verse, all those things, all those titles is for what purpose? So that, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness, that you may proclaim his excellencies, that you may announce the good news. When we grasp who we are in Jesus, we want other people to know it. Man, we get freaked out when we talk about evangelism. We get freaked out when we talk about witnessing because in our minds we kind of have these distorted views of what that means. If you grew up in a church like I did, it means like every Thursday night, 7 p.m., you're going to go out and knock X amount of doors and you're going to ask that, that, that question when someone answers the door. Hey, if you died tonight, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? Like again, as I've told you here before, like that's not a question you probably want to lead with and with a stranger in today's culture, okay? So if you meet a guy brand new, probably don't let the first question out of your mouth be, hey, if you died today, Do you know where you would spend eternity? You may not want to know the answer to that. You may not want to be the recipient in the South of how that person responds. The point is, we get freaked out when we talk about evangelism. Devin, what do I say? What if they ask me this theological question and I don't know the answer? Peter gives us here what our calling is. Peter says, proclaim his goodness. Proclaim his goodness. You've tasted his kindness. Proclaim His excellencies. So I am also, outside of being the pastor of City Church, um, work in sales with another company. And I had a meeting with a guy a couple weeks ago. And he was flying into our corporate office. And I took him out for dinner one night. And he was going to meet with our executives the next day. 
And we went to dinner, and the guy's from New Jersey, right outside of New York City. So born and raised um, in the Northeast, and everything you can picture about a New York guy, like this guy's it. Like accent, straight to the point, in your face, everything that you picture, like that's New York people. He fits the stereotype. So first time he'd ever been, we are in Birmingham, first time he'd ever been to the South, and he said to me, when I got here, Devin, I noticed like there's so many churches, like you guys are so religious, like why there's so many churches in the South, and I've never been to church my entire life, I don't know anything about that, and so you're in this kind of awkward position where you know like as a salesperson, it's not my role in this moment to be witnessing to this guy, and it's kind of crossing boundaries I shouldn't be crossing, and so I was kind of taken back, like I don't know how, so we kind of had a generic conversation about it, and I, it bothered me, and so I said to Ash that night, like, on the phone, like, I'm kind of in this weird situation, and I don't know how to respond in that moment. Like, I don't know what lines I can and can't cross um, in a company position, because I'm not there to be a witness in that moment. I'm there to be a salesperson, and I didn't know. I just prayed about it. Like, Jesus, like, I don't know all the, the clear answers on this. I told you guys before, like, I'm not the guy that has all the answers. I just point you to the person that does have all the answers. And so, I prayed about that night, and the next morning we sat down for breakfast before we were heading over to corporate, and he brought it up again. He said to me, why are so many people religious in the South? And he said, Devin, are you a religious person? And I said, can we talk off record right now for a minute? And he was like, absolutely. And so the only thing I knew to do was say, I can't answer the question why there's so many religious, but I can tell you what Jesus has done in my life and allowed me the opportunity to say, this is what I was, and this is who I am, because of Jesus. I was not a people, had not received mercy in the darkness. But now, I am a person who has received mercy, who has tasted his goodness, and I was able to share with him my story. That's the most basic method of evangelism in all the Bible. To just tell people what God has done in your life, is doing in your life, who you are in Jesus. We don't have time to get into it. There's this incredible story in John chapter 9 of this guy that Jesus heals that was blind. And the religious leaders are all riled up about it. And they call the guy in trying to expose him as a fraud. And they're asking him again and again, like, tell us what happened and who are you and who you claim to be. And you say you're this blind guy. Are you really that blind guy? And they bring the guy's parents in. The the parents are, that's our boy. But, like, why are you asking us? Go ask him. He's the guy the miracle happened to. And so they keep, like, probing this guy, probing this guy, probing this guy. And the guy's like, well, do you guys want to follow too? Like, is that why you're asking me all these questions? Do you want to be a believer too? And finally he gets frustrated. And this is basically what he says. I don't have all the answers. Here's what I know. I could not see, I was blind, but now I can see. Proclaim His excellencies. Let's end with 11 and 12. Beloved, so again, he's talking to us as followers. I urge you as sojourners, here's our titles, our sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when, you speak, when they speak against you as evildoers that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Peter breaks down very practically the implications of our royal bloodline. He says, look, you are exiles. You are passing through. Everything I've just described about you Based on who you are, what does he say? There are things, there are things I will not do because of who I am in Jesus. Why would I want to be controlled by my sinful flesh? My sinful flesh just wants to wreak havoc on my soul, wreak havoc on my life. You've heard me say it again and again, the purpose of sin is to destroy you. You know that. Like sin destroys your relationships. It destroys your bank account. It destroys your peace. We get it. Like the works of the flesh want to wreak havoc on your soul. Peter says, know who you are. When you know who you are, there are things that you will not do because of who you are in Jesus. I am a child of the King. I am His. Live like it. Don't be controlled. 
by things that want to destroy you. The flip side of that, because I am His, there are things I do. Not only things that I abstain from doing, there are things I do. And here he says, I live my life before others like, I live, like I'm marked by Jesus. That I'm marked by goodness, that my life is honorable. Because we are a nation within the nations, there's this natural social tension that takes place. Let me tell you, we are under the authority of a different king. And he's a good king, a grace-filled king. So my response to the rock is different. And so what that means is I live in a culture where the rock is a stumbling block. There are times those worlds collide. That's the story of the church. And it's been built on the blood of people. That our history is bloody because the rock causes some people to believe and some people to be turned away. And those two worlds collide. We're a nation within the nations. And yet, Peter describes here, our life as a follower as honorable. We are people who have received mercy. Therefore, our life should reflect the goodness of our King. I'm under the authority of the King of Kings who has poured grace out on me. Therefore, my life should be filled with grace and mercy. Here's a challenging thought that God hit me between the eyes with this week. Am I living a life that reflects the magnitude of the grace that I've received? Am I living a life that reflects the magnitude of the grace that I've been given? And maybe less people are interested in Jesus because they don't see Jesus in His people. Maybe less people are interested in learning about Jesus because they don't see Jesus in us. The early church, as hostile as their culture was, there's a book of the Bible that was written about the first century church. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, what? Acts. The book of Acts is about the first century church. And the title that we have given it is Acts. The Acts of the Apostles. Not the beliefs, not the doctrine, not the history. The Acts of the Apostles. Because they were defined by their acts toward other people. Even when their culture was anti-Jesus, they were known for their acts. They exalted Jesus. They exclaimed Him. Let me make this point and we're done. Culture most often takes its notion about Jesus from those who claim to follow Him. The culture in which you live, the people in your home, your workplace, your friends, your neighbors, your sphere of influence. Your culture takes this notion about Jesus most often from those who claim to follow him. You may be the only Bible that some people ever read. What does your life say? What message? is your life preaching. We hate the thought of living in glass houses and people that live in glass houses shouldn't throw rocks, a common cliche, but the reality is if you're a follower of Jesus, you're living in a glass house. And people are taking their notion about who Jesus is from who you are. Does my life proclaim the excellencies of Jesus. 
if the opinion of my circle of influence about Jesus was based strictly on me, what would that opinion be? As we are coming to him. He is the cornerstone. As we are coming to him, as we rest in who he is, as we rest in who we are in him, we need Jesus. We need him. We need him, not just for our salvation, but our everyday life as we live in a culture that is often defined by hostility, as we live in a culture where the rock both draws some to belief and many to unbelief, as we try to navigate these waters of how do I follow Jesus in a culture that doesn't, how do I live for Jesus in a culture where everyone around me doesn't necessarily, as I try to follow Jesus and mirror who he is to my sphere of influence, we need him. We need Him. We rest in Him. And we proclaim His excellencies. My desire is not that people look at my life and say, Devin's a good guy. My desire is not that people look at my life and say, He's a good X, Y, and Z. He does this. He doesn't do those things. My desire is that people might look at my life and they say, man, he must serve an awesome God. Man, Jesus has changed that guy. My desire is to proclaim his excellencies. You know why? I've tasted his goodness. I've tasted His kindness. I've tasted His grace. And grace becomes a way of life. Let's bow our heads for prayer.